Welcome to the Investor Download, the podcast about the themes driving markets and the economy now and in the future. I'm your host, David Brett. So uh, being the auto analyst, it's kind of the, the ultimate irony is I've never owned a vehicle. That's our man in New York, David Speyer, a small cap equity analyst for Schroders. I live in uh, New York and we don't, I don't really have a use for a vehicle here. Despite not owning a vehicle, David's an expert on all things to do with electric vehicles or EVs for sure. And the EV industry is enjoying an exceptional period of growth one exemplified by its bellwether, Tesla. Next, how about Tesla? All right, what, what did it do to reserve that 11% rally? Uh, Tesla reporting better than expected results. They beat on the top of the bottom line, record profits for the fourth quarter, record quarterly profits for Tesla, as well as record quarterly revenues. Electric car sales nearly doubled in 2021, according to the International Energy Agency. Yet not everyone in the industry has been a winner. It's been a struggle for some of your big names, the traditional OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. Like a Ford or a GM or even a Mercedes or a Volkswagen. Um, It's been a real challenge to really change the way you think about producing vehicles. Uh, Your supply chain has changed. You now need a supply of raw commodities like lithium, nickel. Um, You need to figure out the different architecture of uh, moving on from ICE vehicle, which is, you know, a gas vehicle to an electric vehicle. Uh, you have to really sort of rechange the way you, you, you think. And it's costing billions and billions of dollars to, to make this transition. And they're sort of being forced to by the investment community because the investment community has really said, listen, we're not going to give you any value for the old vehicle architecture that you've been producing. We want you to produce EV vehicles. And you see the, dis- the difference between the valuation for a company like Tesla versus Ford. Tesla is the 15th most valuable company in the world with a $415 billion price tag, according to companies marketcap.com. Compare that with Ford, which makes many more cars, but valued at just $51 billion. From the standpoint of the traditional OEMs, it's been a real challenge. And so I would say it's been not, you know, they, they've sort of been losers or they've, they've kind of suffered from this from this change. Um, but companies like Tesla, for example, who were early and really had relatively no competition are really benefit. That really paints a big picture of, of where investors want these companies to go. The direction investors want them to go in is electric to take advantage of EVs growing market share, which has almost doubled over recent years. EVs have been benefiting because the growth rate has been very high. But again, it's from very small numbers. I mean, globally, you know, the, I think there's something like 85 million vehicles expected to be produced in 2023 and only about 10 million AVs. So right now, you know, that's about a 12 percent or so penetration rate. From small acorns to great oak trees grow. But the story of EVs is unlikely to be one that is linear and in an upward trajectory. It certainly won't be a case of buying stock in an EV manufacturer and watching its shares go to the moon. Experts are already warning the industry faces challenges over the next few years, ranging from battery and chip supply issues to rising costs and charger shortages. And we've been here before, believe it or not, way back in the 1800s. So nearly 200 years after electric cars were first invented, we're once again asking, what does the future look like for the electric car industry? On Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, you're listening to the Investor Download. Ironically, the history of electric cars has been littered with false starts. They've been around since the early 1800s. If we, if we look back over the history of EVs, the first car, the first electric vehicle was actually produced in 1830, so almost two centuries ago. That's Jack Schufelt, an analyst at Schroders. A big reason for the popularity was due to the simplicity of creating an, an electric engine. So we know that internal combustions require thousands of moving parts where an, uh, an electric vehicle requires far fewer parts. And then secondly, there were advantages just in simplicity of use. So for example, one had to crank the engine of an internal combustion in order to get the car to start. 
And perhaps this is the reason why Henry Ford's wife chose to drive a competitor's electric vehicle over her husband's Model T. Wouldn't have liked to have been around the dinner table that night. We'll get back to the Model T shortly, as it will prove crucial to the early part of the EV story. But by the turn of the 20th century, EVs were thriving, particularly in New York City. In the early 1900s, EVs were quite popular. In fact, I think the first taxi fleet in New York City was all EV operated. They had these 200 EVs. And they would essentially, the way they dealt with the charging issue was they had this almost like a stadium where they'd pull the EVs in, they'd switch out the batteries, and they'd, they'd be off to uh, pick up more customers. Some historians estimate that around a third of cars on American streets in 1900 were electric. It wasn't just the US. In Europe, electric cars were popular in London. Walter Bursley's Hummingbird taxis could be found on the streets of the capital, while the 1898 Porsche P1 was electric. As well as the simplicity of their engines, EVs were relatively cheap to run. However, the performance of the cars, the early state of the roads, and the charging network outside of cities meant journeys were typically short and their popularity didn't last long. The issue was, was, was the charging component and the infrastructure wasn't there. Most like outside, Once you got outside the cities in the US, there, there wasn't access to electricity. And even though there wasn't access to gas stations either, what drivers found is they could put a couple tanks of gasoline on the back of the car and refill as they went, which wasn't an option for EVs. Another reason was cost. Henry Ford and Thomas Edison had teamed up to create an electric vehicle together. However, the car was four times more expensive than Ford's Model T, which priced out many customers. Issues with battery life, access to charging stations outside of cities and the cost of the vehicles themselves are complaints that are all too familiar with modern day electric cars. More of that later. Back in the 1900s, however, the Ford Model T and the mass production technique pioneered by Henry Ford drove down the cost of the combustion engine vehicle significantly causing a headache for electric car makers. It brought cars to the masses and for the best part of the next century consigned electric vehicles largely to warehouses and milk floats. And yet, whirring away quietly in the background, like the noise of an electric engine, was the slow rebirth of the electric car. What the industry needed was a catalyst, something that would spark wider adoption. What occurred over a number of years was a confluence of circumstances that would kickstart the EV revolution again. The first was cost. A few things have triggered the revival. I think the biggest one being cost. In 2010, the cost per kilowatt of a battery was roughly $1,200 for today's price, which is around 140 To put that into perspective, Tesla's Model 3 battery uses 60 kilowatt hours. So the cost of Tesla's Model 3 would have been about $60,000 more expensive in 2010 than it is today, just on the cost of the battery alone. Then came the historic agreement in Paris in 2015, where countries agreed to limit temperature rises and cap carbon emissions. More reaction now to the historic climate change deal that's been agreed in Paris. Never before have nearly 150 heads of state and government filled one room. So many foes today united under the banner of climate change. Never before has a responsibility so great been in the hands of so few. That lit the blue touch paper for the regulation that would heavily impact the traditional car industry and the scandals that would tarnish its reputation. I think Europe was a, was a very big part of it because of the, the emissions restrictions that they were placing on the industry. Um, you had some very bad players, like like there was a Volkswagen scandal. The CEO of Volkswagen in America apologizing during a grilling in Congress about how the company cheated on emissions tests. So let's be clear about this. Our company was dishonest with the EPA and the California Air Resources Board and with all of you. And in my German words, we have totally screwed up. They were sort of faking, you know, how, you know, fuel efficient their diesel vehicles were. Uh, to try to skirt some of these regulations. And these regulations were only becoming more and more burdensome to the industry, and they were taxing the industry for, for failure to meet these emissions in the sense that they were having to pay the government. Um, and so the whole industry knew that 
regula re regulations across the world were changing. And if they don't change how they do their business, it's going to be unprofitable to continue the ways that, the way that they've done it. Then came the pandemic and the war in Ukraine, which sent fuel prices rocketing and demand for electric vehicles soaring. Today, electric car sales have reached record highs. The total number of electric cars on the road were estimated to be 16.5 million at the end of 2021. And data from 2022 suggests that market will continue to grow. However, there's already been murmurings that things might not be as plain sailing as some might expect in the short term. And that's what's coming up in part two of the show. Get in touch with us by email at shorterspodcasts at shorters.com or visit our website shorters.com forward slash the investor download. If you travelled back to 1900 and told someone that one of the issues electric cars would be facing in 2023 was batteries, they'd scarcely believe you. Battery longevity is a nut the industry is desperately trying to crack. But in the short term, it's the supply of batteries which is the problem. Last year, Carlos Tavares, chief executive of Stellantis, one of the world's biggest car makers, warned of a looming crisis for the transition towards the electric vehicle. In particular, he said battery shortages could affect the industry as soon as 2025. So there are three key materials for the production of batteries which go into EVs, lithium, nickel, and cobalt. All of these materials are in short supply and all have witnessed a relentless surge in price over the last two years, albeit none as great as lithium. These are rare earth materials, the race for which we'll go into in more depth in a future show, but they're vital to battery power and therefore electric cars. Lithium is the most sought after, its value has risen tenfold since the start of 2021, according to TradingEconomics.com. Demand is vastly outstripping supply, and Jack projects the world will need five times the supply of lithium by 2030. Elon Musk once tweeted that lithium's everywhere. What Mr. Musk left out is that it takes about a decade for a new mine to come online, given the long permitting processes. And we think the world needs 40 additional mines to come online to meet, meet demand by 2030, which is a massive undertaking. 40 mines might not sound like uh, a lot, but today there's about 10 mines producing any producing lithium of any meaning, uh, with three of the largest mines producing nearly half of the world's lithium. In North America, which contains a meaningful amount of lithium reserves, there's currently only one mine. I'd say there's an arms race right now in building out not only EV platforms, but also managing this tricky supply chain. Given the auto makers around the world have pledged an investment of a trillion dollars, I'd say they're taking things very seriously. Some of the largest car companies in the US are signing long-term deals to partner with miners and battery producers to ease funding and supply constraints while the US government authorised nearly $400 billion in spending on energy and climate change as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, or the IRA, which was passed in the US in 2022. For investors, these challenges are going to provide great opportunity to identify the winners throughout the supply chain and capitalise on the changing dynamic of investment, which is going to shift from Asia to, to the US. And even if the battery shortage is solved, there's still the issue of the charging network. Again, something someone from the early 20th century could sympathise with. A reduction in subsidised charging from retailers, not to mention falling gas prices, and a general lack of charging points is challenging the EV market. Take the US, which is a microcosm of the global charging issue data shows there's 53,000 public charging stations to support 141,000 individual charging ports. But the US is vast and the growth in EV ownership is only going to accelerate. It's just nowhere near enough. Now to provide the scale of the challenge ahead of us, we need to compare that to that 140,000 existing charging ports to the 13 million public chargers that are estimated to be needed in the United States by 2030. And that's roughly a cost of $11 billion, according to a McKinsey study. That's Azari Nadeki, an analyst with a focus on the EV charging network. Infrastructure bills will provide part of the funding, but $5 billion is still a long way short. 
And that's before you start talking about the power generation needed to sate the energy needs of a rapidly expanding EV market. And assuming going forward over the next eight years, we average around 5 million of new electric vehicles sold per year. That means by the year 2030, we will have around 60 million electric vehicles on the road, which is roughly 20% of U.S. registered vehicles. Now, that pool of cars will require 249 billion kilowatt hours of electric consumption. I know a big number, but to keep it simple, it turns up to about 5% of the total current electric production. While that number doesn't seem large, we will have to, this will have to come up on the top of reduction of coal-based electricity, which even today still adds up to 20% of domestic electricity generation. That means that in order to meet our Paris Agreement, which we've rejoined recently, goal of reducing our economy-wide CO2 emissions by 50% versus 2005 levels in the electric generation industry, we will likely need to add 20 to 25% of our generation over the next eight years. Then there's the problem with the shortage of computer chips. And the reason why we got there was, you know, we had grow, we have growing electronic content per vehicle. Um, that's easy to see with all the new features. Um, we had pent up demand for cars during the pandemic. And we also had factory shutdowns in China, um, which is uh, obviously where all where the majority of the chips are produced. That's Stephen Kerson, a small cap analyst with a keen eye on chip makers. Chip supply constraints are expected to ease in the second half of 2023, according to some estimates. However, the problems industries like the electric car industry faces is getting their hands on the right kind of chips. The big opportunity um, for semiconductors within that is, is uh, power management chips. And those are used to ch both charge the, the onboard battery and then manage the power supply to the engine. Um, and as a result of the voltages um, required uh, when it comes to electric vehicles, those chips have to be made from something that's known as silicon carbide, as opposed to silicon, which is, um, has been used to make you know, a lot of uh, semiconductors that go into computing devices. But that's also where opportunities lie. Silicon carbide semiconductors can operate at much higher voltages, temperatures and frequencies than traditional silicon-based semiconductors. That makes them a better choice not only for electric vehicles, but also for solar power conversion, 5G wireless and aerospace, among other applications. It's created a gold rush for the next generation of semiconductors, but it also comes with a health warning. Um, the production process within silicon carbide is, is much more challenging, um, all the way from the early stages of wafer development through the entire fabrication pr um, process. Um, and silicon carbide production itself is still in the early stages of scaling. And um, with that, you get the possibility of, of getting speed bumps along the way as, as, the, technology, as the process matures. So those are the those are the challenges um, on the opportunity side. You know, automakers have already announced five hundred billion dollars of investments in electric vehicles, next generation electric vehicles by 2000, uh, 2030. You know, many of those companies are predicting that fifty percent um, of all cars that they make are going to be electric by then. Um, the transition from what's what's known as ICE, or that's that's an acronym for internal combustion engine to BEV, battery electric vehicle, um, nearly doubles the amount of semiconductor content from $500 per vehicle to roughly about $1,000 per vehicle. And industry analysts are forecasting um, silicon carbide power device market to reach $6.3 billion by 2027, which is up from about $1.6 billion in 2022. Huge growth rate. That's about a 30% compounded annual growth rate. And layered on top of the transition opportunity, um, I'm sorry, the transportation opportunity is a further opportunity for silicon carbide to penetrate the industrial and energy markets, such as solar energy. Um, and analysts estimate that adds another possible $2 billion of revenue by 2027. To solve these issues costs money, which ultimately gets passed on to consumers. And there's a concern, like 100 years ago, that drivers are at risk of being priced out of the electric revolution. For instance, a survey on electrifying.com website highlights very few new models of electric cars are on sale in the UK for under £30,000. On top of that, some states are withdrawing subsidies for electric cars. 
Consumers and investors will need clarification. But while there are challenges ahead, there are plenty of opportunities. And that's what we'll discuss in the final part of the show. By 2040, electric cars are forecast to account for 80% of car sales, according to data on the Nature.com website. Surely, despite its issues, that means the electric vehicle industry presents opportunities. So there are, there are you know, many ways that you could play this in terms of investment opportunities. We, we had focused on a lot of the suppliers that have products that will continue to be used in EVs. That can include anything from suppliers helping to increase the range of vehicles and energy efficiency to luxuries within the car, as well as the chips, batteries and hardware needed to drive it. The supplier base is the ones that provide the parts they sell to the OEMs. They have multiple OEM customers, so they don't care if, if they have Ford and GM as a customer, for example. They don't care if Ford is ramping up quicker or versus GM. They're they're selling to both, um, you know. And 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 through that, you know, the the traditional OEMs, are, because they need to shift over and start to compete with the Tesla, they need the supplier base, and so they can't do this just themselves, and so. Because of that, there's going to be a real pull for product and innovation from that supplier base. And finding those suppliers that can innovate, that can sort of be ahead of their competition and introduce new and interesting offerings, they're, they're going to win. Speyer says that investing in the car manufacturers themselves is a tougher challenge. He says newer, younger, EV-only manufacturers face stiff tests scaling up production. Meanwhile, more established names trying to move into EVs from traditional internal combustion engine vehicles face the same challenge while also producing traditional vehicles, which is still the most profitable parts of their business. So it's challenging from the OEM perspective. Um, And then, you know, obviously the commodity costs have been going up and that's a challenge because battery costs have been going up and there's scale and inefficiencies that the OEMs have. So, um, So it's very hard, you know, So from an investment perspective, I think the supplier base is sort of the best way to attack it, given how much competition there'll be on the OEM side, and as well as, you know, the challenges they're going to face as they ramp up production. Unlike back in the early 1900s, Speyer says this time, despite its challenges, it doesn't look like the electric vehicle revolution will stall. So, those more traditional car makers know they'll have to rise to the challenge or face the consequences. I think that regardless of regime changes, of how you know the government tr- treats um, ICE vehicles versus EV vehicles, it, it's it's all it's moving that way, and 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 there's too many uh, tailwinds, you know, to the industry to move towards EV and and then then headwinds to moving towards EV. So I I think the writing's already on the wall regardless. Here's what else investors are talking about. carbon footprint of a bank is relatively small in terms of operating its offices and branches. But as providers of finance, banks make a critical difference to the emissions of their clients and the planet as a whole. Financed emissions are therefore the key metric to look at for banks. Justin Bissica, a banks analyst in the European Equities team, spent more than a month in 2022 engaging with nine European banks over climate issues. You can read about his experiences in the Q&A, how he engaged with European banks over climate change by visiting schroders.com forward slash insights, where you can read, watch and listen to much, much more. Well, that was the show. We very much hope you enjoyed it. If you want to find out more, check out our website, schroders.com forward slash the investor download. You can also get in contact with us about anything in the show or ideas for future shows at Schroders Podcast at schroders.com. Please remember to subscribe to us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to leave a review. 
We're now doing one show a week, which will be available every Thursday from 5 p.m. UK time. Thanks very much for listening, but above all, keep safe and go well. Cheers. The value of investments and the income from them may go down as well as up. And investors may not get back the amounts originally invested. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The information is not an offer, solicitation or recommendation of any funds, services or products or to adopt any investment strategy. 